Chapter 7, The Grand Alliance Elida put on the headset while Jeremy helped the professor. They were in the chemistry lab and everything was ready for the video conference. Walter, Ulrich, Richard, and Eva were seated at the students' benches, at the back of the monitor, so as not to be seen by Dido. Elida and Hertz were sitting side by side at the teacher's desk. Jeremy and Elida had come prepared down to the last detail. They had checked that the Green Phoenix had no spy camera or microphone in the laboratory, and had then installed a cryptographic program onto the computer. Hertz and Elida both had a microphone to talk to Dido, while the others could hear their dialogue thanks to speakers. It's Thursday, 1 o'clock in the morning, Jeremy commented, looking at his watch. So in Washington it must be, 7 in the afternoon, Wednesday, Elida concluded. Bullrich scratched his head, not really understanding. We've already studied time zones, Bullrick, the professor groaned. You should know how they work. The boy went as red as a tomato and Jeremy took advantage of the pause to complete the final adjustments on the computer. We're ready, he said. Let's hope that Dido is already in her office. 3, 2, 1. Call started. Elida concentrated on the blank screen. After several instants the image of a woman appeared. She was around Hertz's age with blonde hair and fine lips. Good morning, Dido, the professor coldly greeted. We are here with Walter Stern, who has explained to us how to get in contact with you. I'm also very pleased to see you again, Major Steinbach, the woman said with a smile. How long has it been since we last met? Eleven years. And that girl with you must be Hopper's daughter. Strange that she's still young. She should be over twenty years old by now. Elida lowered her eyes, intimidated but Hertz immediately intervened. We need to talk about some very important matters, she said dryly. The professor quickly brought Dido up to speed with recent events, up until the father-son meeting at the Hermitage and the invasion of the factory by Mago's men. These children, she finally said, have proved themselves, they discovered Lyoko and fought Xana all by themselves. But now, this is different. We need your help against the terrorists. Are you thinking of military intervention? The Parisian region has too many citizens. It could be complicated. No soldiers, Elida interrupted, leaning towards the screen. We want a peaceful solution. Listen, ma'am, my friends and I know the virtual worlds by heart and we're convinced that it's possible to stop the Green Phoenix through Lyoko. But to succeed, we'll need your cooperation. Walter's appearance at the Hermitage damaged the access scanner, blocking two of our friends in an isolated digital environment, my father's journal. We can't use the scanners at the factory, as they're currently out of reach. And let's not even think about the trinkets in Brussels, they're much too old for. Ah yes, Brussels. You do realize you trespassed on government property, right, children? You could end up in prison. What we want, Elida continued, not allowing herself to be intimidated, is access to the information about the connection to the first city. That way, we can connect ourselves directly to the replica, then the scanner, which we intend to build, without needing to go to Brussels. That won't be a problem, Dido nodded. What else? Elida smiled. Professor Hertz here has a dossier full of codes that we haven't managed to decipher, the professor jumped in her seat, but Elida continued without pausing. If we find out what they're for. I know what the codes are, Hertz interrupted. Waldo and I prepared them together not long ago. It's the code down, the definitive weapon to destroy Lyoko and the first city once and for all. At that moment, Eva Skinner leapt up and ran out of the laboratory. The girl began to move through the deserted hallway in huge strides. Walk to calm down, another human habit. She really had to do something to resolve this delicate situation. At that moment, Xana hated himself for not succeeding in possessing Professor Hertz. So these mysterious codes were to create a weapon capable of destroying Lyoko. In behaving like this, he ran the risk of being discovered, but he couldn't contain his rage. Destroying the virtual world meant destroying him as well, and he could not allow that. The children then came out of the laboratory. Jeremy and Elida were holding hands and smiling. I'm sorry if I interrupted you, Eva said, lowering her head. I didn't want to bother you, 
but it's just that, I needed to go to the bathroom. No problem, Elida responded. The negotiations went very well. Dido is ready to give us a hand. As long as the Green Phoenix are in town, we'll be allied with the men in black. That's correct, Jeremy added. Now, I also have the access codes to the first city. As soon as we build a new scanner you can go there, and get Yumi and Odd out of the mirror. And the code down? Eva asked. Hertz exited the laboratory adjusting her lab coat. She seemed very exhausted. It's a long story, kids, she commented. We'll talk about it tomorrow. For the moment, it's time for bed. Everyone considered this a good idea and Eva was forced to give in. She had to wait longer. Plus, the prospect of entering the first city was more than sufficient to guarantee her a good night's sleep. But you don't sleep. You're an artificial intelligence. Xana said to himself. It was strange that, from time to time, he had to remind himself of something so basic. <music> Professor Hopper was in the Hermitage's attic. In reality, Yumi was also there in a corner, hidden there with Odd, still unconscious. But the man couldn't see them anyway. The mirror had brought the girl further forward in time, and she now found herself on the 3rd of June, 1994. It was the afternoon, and the warm light of summer entered through the window. The attic was jam-packed with books and papers. Hopper was hunched over a large desk, scrawling notes, and grumbling to himself. At a certain point, he stood up and violently slammed his palm into the table. It doesn't work, he cried. The code down is still incomplete. Too many variables are getting away from me. He began to pace back and forth across the attic. He arrived at the window, from which Caddick Academy's park could be seen, and then retraced his steps to almost trample Yumi, seated on the floor, head between her knees. I need space on my disk to register the backup. Too much space, darn it. Where am I going to find such a powerful memory system? It would need to be able to conserve my data for a very long time. The professor started to walk again. Yumi turned her gaze from him to study the navigation system control box. She had escaped Xana's claws for the moment, but she wasn't sure that she was totally safe. Maybe Xana really was able to use the Lyoko inside the mirror to enter the Lyoko of the present. What had he said about the box? It was an interface that allowed one to interact with the virtual world. And all he had needed was the power of his own thoughts in order to directly use machines. Yumi knew that she had to warn the others, to get back in contact with reality. But she didn't know how to do it. She pressed her ear, as if she were wearing an earpiece that didn't really exist. Jeremy, she murmured. Can you hear me? Anyone? I'm here. Elida's voice responded. Yumi leapt to her feet, looking all around her like mad, and saw her friend enter the attic. She was dressed in her usual dungarees, her hair cut short and wearing a magnificent smile on her face. Yumi ran towards her, brimming with happiness, and wrapped her arms around her. It was like trying to grab air. She passed straight through her, lost her balance and fell to the floor. She whipped around and saw the girl greet her father by kissing him on the cheek. Oh, no, it wasn't the real Elida. It was just a recording in the mirror. Just like Hopper. Is everything going well, daddy? The young girl asked. Chapter 8, Soldiers in the Virtual World The first underground floor of the factory housed the control system of the supercomputer. Hannibal Mago entered the broad room, illuminated by a greenish light which came directly from the walls. At the center, there was a circular platform that a mess of mechanical arms and electrical cables hung from. Between the platform and the device's overhead floated a sphere that seemed similar to a small planet divided into four differently colored sections. At the center of the sphere shone a very vivid, white-colored core. Mago stopped to admire this nearly transparent world that was suspended in air. That's Lyoko then, he asked. Memory sat on a very comfortable chair that had a series of buttons on the arms, pivoting a short distance from the platform and surrounded by an imposing console composed of buttons, screens, and levers. The woman was busy with the computer commands, but she turned as soon as she heard her boss's voice. Yes, it's a projection of Lyoko. From here, I can control all of Lyoko, manage its towers, and especially see where our men are located. Mago approached her and started to study the hologram of Lyoko. One of its quarters, the one in green. 
had a bright rectangular label superimposed over it, on which three-dimensional letters read, Lyoko Forest. On the surface of the green quarter were three red, immobile icons. Memory pointed at them. These three icons here indicate the position of our unit. And why aren't they moving, asked the man with a weary voice. I haven't the slightest idea, Memory admitted. There should be a way to communicate with them. But perhaps I haven't yet figured out how to activate the microphone. I tried to talk to them, but they didn't hear me. Zoom in, Mago said. I can do even better. The woman's fingers began to hammer at the keyboard. One of the monitors went dark, then lit up again, showing a new image. It appeared to be a scene from a video game. The sky was a shade of light blue, although there was no sun or clouds to be seen. The ground was solid, flat, and green, which was supposed to resemble grass in theory, and there were several tall trees with narrow trunks. They were possibly birch trees, but the trunks were too straight and smooth, and they rose so high into the sky that their tops could not be seen. There was no such tree in the real world. It's a static image. Mago asked. No, it's a video. It shows exactly what, memory glanced at another screen, the soldier Callum is seeing. But they aren't moving. Why? I was convinced that the lack of audio was to blame, said the woman, shrugging her shoulders. That they were waiting for our orders. No one can remain still for this long. They haven't even turned their heads. Bring them in immediately. Something must have happened to them. Memory obeyed. The attic of the hermitage began to grow dark. Orange evening light entered through the windows as the sun set. It was the sunset of the 3rd of June, 1994, to be precise. Yumi sighed. How many hours had she been trapped in the mirror? Hopper and Elida, or rather, their recordings, had been away from the attic for a very long time, but she had decided not to follow them. Discovering the content of the professor's journal didn't interest her anymore. She only wanted to go back home to warn the others that Xana was alive. At the young girl's feet, Odd was still asleep on his side with his mouth hanging open, his chest barely moving. Can't you wake up? Yumi whispered to him softly, touching his shoulder. You don't know how much I need you. She waited a moment, and when nothing happened, she shook him with all her might. Wake up, Odd, please. I'm serious. Huh, responded the boy, opening one eye, then the other. He sensitively placed his head between his hands, as if he feared that it might explode. I feel like a steamroller ran over my... He couldn't finish his sentence. Yumi fell to her knees and gave him a bear hug. Tears of joy fell down her cheeks. She was no longer alone. Hey, not so tight, muttered Odd. You're suffocating me, the boy sat up straight and looked all around himself with curiosity. Where are we? At the hermitage? It's really hot for January. MHM. Actually, it's June. The 3rd of June, 1994. Whoa, that's crazy. Med scientist Jeremy managed to build a time travel machine like in that movie, Back to the Future. If he used a car, I hope he used the right race car, like a Ferrari or a Porsche or... Yumi burst out laughing and placed a hand on his mouth to keep him quiet. This was truly the odd she'd always known. He never missed the chance to crack a joke. The young girl filled him in on the situation, telling him about the mirror and the discoveries that she had made about Hopper and Elida's past. And then, she told him about the most terrible discovery of them all, Xana. I remember now. Eva Skinner. Odd burst out, somehow managing to stay silent up until then. I went to go see her at her house, and she was Xana she kissed me and... Everything became muddled after that. Eva? Xana possessed her too? Then we have a really big problem. It's been at least a day since I last managed to contact Jeremy. We can't even warn him of the danger. You'll see, they can take care of themselves, Odd assured her with a smile. I'm more worried about something else. I didn't fully explain myself. I went to see Eva because I found a strange memory card. The man with the dogs dropped it when he attacked my father. It had a video saved on it showing Elida's mother. She was tied to a chair, being held prisoner. I don't know what to think anymore. You want to know something else strange. Your father and my parents. Hopper knew them. I heard him talking about them with Elida several hours ago, well, several hours ago in the June of 1994. How can that be? 
There were more mysterious elements to this story with every discovery. Though personally, I think it's up to us to solve the most important problem, said Odd looking all around himself, worriedly. Xana. No, he responded in a very serious tone of voice. Food. It's been ages since I last ate. Yumi felt her stomach contort. It was true, she hadn't had anything to eat either since she entered the mirror. Although, they obviously couldn't eat anything here, could they? They were virtual least, and these weren't their physical bodies, and... Let's go find something to eat, said Odd, getting up. The doors of the scanner opened with a hum, and the soldier fell flat on his stomach. Two of his squad mates were ready to catch him, so that he would not hit his head hard from his fall. Hannibal Mago observed him while the soldiers laid him on the ground and memory leaned over him with a stethoscope to check his vital signs. This is the third man now that we sent to Lyoko, noted Mago, and his condition seems just as bad as the others. Memory removed the stethoscope from her ears and nodded. Yes, she confirmed. He is still alive, but he's in a state of shock. But why? The woman stood and managed a shy smile. Mago immediately understood and motioned for her to follow him. They both returned to the lift and headed up to the ground floor of the factory, then entered the nomadic tent. Once there, Mago removed his shoes and dropped them onto the soft cushions. He picked up a silver teapot that was spouting a fine stream of clear, aromatic vapor. The waiter had been diligent. At 5 o'clock on the dot, his tea was there. Hannibal served himself a cup and savored the bitter liquid. He didn't ask Memory if she would like some. He left her waiting there, standing around. What happened to him, he said several moments later, waving his hand. I believe that it's due to the virtualization scanners, the woman replied. When a human being is virtualized, their body completely disintegrates, and the computer takes the data and reconstructs it onto Lyoko. Get to the point, ordered Mago, these technical details didn't interest him one bit. At the time that the body is reconstructed in the virtual world, the computer doesn't base it on the physical structure of the real body, but instead uses the person's subconscious image of their own self. To put it shortly, on Lyoko, everyone takes on the characteristics that correspond with the feelings they have about themselves and how they see themselves. In a sense, on Lyoko, everyone finds their true form, which is very different than that of the one on our world. Mago finished his tea. I completed several analyses, Memory continued to explain. On the images of Lyoko that I took through the eyes of our soldiers. They had all acquired monstrous appearances. One, for example, was transformed into an immense spider, and another was a child that seemed completely lost and was covered in a yellow substance that seemed like, vomit. Gross, Mago commented, gasping in disgust. It doesn't surprise me that they were in a state of shock. Yes. It's difficult for us to face our greatest fears and accept the vision that we have of ourselves. These soldiers have dirted their hands in all sorts of crime. And when Lyoko forces them to look reality in the face, they crumble and become immobilized. And they become completely useless, cried the leader of the Green Phoenix, standing up from his cushions and starting to pace back and forth. He needed his men to enter the fifth sector, the core of Lyoko, and to open the passage that would connect him to the first city. But how could they succeed if they became totally paralyzed the moment they set foot in the virtual world? With a bit of luck, Mago murmured. Another unit might have a better chance. I. No, said Memory, looking at him unsteadily. I don't think that would, try it. Send another group of soldiers to Lyoko to see what happens. If that doesn't work, continue experimenting. Maybe you'll come up with a useful idea. Yes, sir. I want a detailed report tomorrow morning. And tell Grigory Nictapolis to be present. We must find a solution to this problem. Memory left the tent, giving a slight bow, leaving Mago alone again, staring fixedly at the large, emerald tapestry. He hated this factory. It reeked of dust and grime. In no way was this appropriate. Accommodation for someone of his class. I feel human again, said Odd, wiping his mouth with one of his catboy sleeves. Yumi studied him with a scrutinizing look. The truth is, when you eat, you become a real animal. You totally emptied out Hopper's fridge. Hopper's fridge, from 1994. I promise you he won't even notice. 
The young boy stood up from the table and opened the door to the enormous fridge that took up much of the space in the hermitage's kitchen. Yumi's eyes opened wide. All while holding the control box in one hand, Ud was able to eat half a cold chicken, a ham, and cheese sandwich, leftover lasagna and a slice of pie. Yet all of this food remained in its original place, the chicken, enveloped in transparent plastic wrap, the lasagna, on its plate. Everything remained as perfect as if it had never been touched. It was incredible. See. Ud told her, winking. And check out the table. Now that the boy was no longer touching the meat, the dirty dishes and the wrinkled napkins became transparent. Tada, said Odd with a chuckle. This box is fantastic. A lot better than washing dishes. It's just like Xana said, noted Yumi. The mirror's navigation box allows us to touch and use any of the objects we see, but nothing can be modified in this world. There's nothing real here. Everything's virtual. But the food is really good, commented her friend, rubbing his stomach. Although, now that I think about it, it was 10 years past the expiration date. I hope that won't upset my stomach. Yumi continued to observe the table, from which the plates had already disappeared. Virtual or not, the food was really good. And the water too. She hadn't realized just how thirsty she was until she had drank almost an entire bottle. Alright, she exclaimed. Now that we've stuffed our faces, we need to decide what we're going to do. We're trapped in this fragment of the past, and we can't warn the others that Xana is free. And at the same time, that computerized monster could be in the process of destroying everything. Exactly, confirmed Ott. Do you have a plan? We could continue to press the fast forward button. The mirror resembles a sort of DVD movie, so with a little bit of luck on our side, if we make it to the credits, the movie will end. And we'll return to the real world. That's cool with me. Odd approached her and took her hand. Hang on tight, he ordered. Then, he pressed the button. No, not at all. There's a problem in my program that I can't isolate. What's more, I have disk space problems, and... Can you tell me what's going on? Elida interrupted, observing him. Susan told me that Walter fired everyone, the Ishiyamas, Robert Della Rabia, Michelle. All of a sudden, Yumi was paying strict attention. Did she say Ishiyama? Was Elida talking about her parents? You need to trust me, my dear. Oh, that goes without saying. But, aside from that, can I help you with anything? Hopper observed her intensely. Perhaps you can. But I don't know if it's a good idea. I mean, I don't know what kind of effect it will have on you. Elida gave him another kiss. If you need me, you can count on me, daddy. No matter the cost. Okay. Maybe it can work, Hopper said with a smile. Jeremy cleaned his greasy hands by briskly rubbing them against his jeans and placed the screwdriver on the floor. Hmm, <laughs> he and Professor Hertz were in the secret room in the hermitage. They had got up very early in the morning and had come to the chalet together to immediately set to work on the scanner. It was a Thursday and Jeremy needed to be in class, but Hertz had spoken to the principal, so he and his friends had been excused from classes for two days with the excuse of helping the professor organize the science textbooks in the laboratory. The teen got out of the column and the professor gave him a glass of cold tea that he downed in one gulp. He wasn't used to physical work and was drenched in sweat. He had changed the fuses but it hadn't been enough. Something mechanical had broken in the arm of the transformer, and, as if that wasn't enough, the motherboard had been toasted. When the current spiked, the scanner was working at full power, and the unexpected interruption had destroyed a delicate component. Hertz attentively listened to his technical explanations and Jeremy smiled. It was very nice to be able to talk to the professor on equal terms. He finally faced someone who truly understood the technological problems he normally had to resolve alone. Maybe with the right equipment, I could repair the arm, he finally added. But not the motherboard, Hertz completed his sentence for him. We need to replace it completely. If we can reach the old factory on the island, I could possibly find some replacement pieces Hopper abandoned there. But with the Green Phoenix terrorists around, it's much too dangerous. Odd and Yumi run the risk of being imprisoned in the mirror forever. Unless, the professor began to say as her mouth curled into a cunning smile, we go to see the creators of the scanner directly. Exactly. It's a shame Professor Hopper isn't here with us. If he were, 
The problem would be solved by now. Jeremy Belpoise, may I remind you that I am your teacher? You need to trust me. And, what's more, I never said that Hopper was the one who constructed the logic circuits in the scanners. If that's the case, then who did? You. No. Someone you know very well, your father. With Mr. Ishiyama. We could get them here and then use my memory snatching machine to give them their memories back. Ulrich opened his eyes and, for a moment, had the impression of not having slept at all. He looked around him, disoriented. He was still in his room, in the Kadok dormitories. On the other hand, Odd wasn't the one in the bed opposite him, but rather an adult man still dressed in suit and tie. His father. After the conversation with Dido, they were all too tired to think about another solution, so Hertz had suggested that he sleep in the dormitories, with his son. Ulrich shook his head. A traitor and the son of a traitor. What a great duo. The teen got out of bed, slipped his feet into a pair of slippers, and glanced at the alarm clock. It was already 10 o'clock in the morning. He hadn't even heard the bell signaling students to go to class. He decided he should go see if Jeremy and the others were already up. Son, Walter murmured. Yes. You're already up. I'm hungry. It's past breakfast time. His father sat up on the bed. His dark suit had been completely crinkled during the night, and a short and shaggy beard had appeared on the man's cheeks. I'm sorry. Why are you telling me you're sorry? Bullrick rattled, giving him a perplexed look. For what I did to you, you, and your mother. I don't know if I've ever been a good father, and I'm sorry for that. I. Come on, the young boy interrupted, forcing a smile. It's not that bad. That's not true. But I want to tell you that I'm very angry at myself. I played a very dangerous game and I lost everything. I had the opportunity to change my life after they erased my memory, compensate in some way for what I had done. And instead of that, I continued to open the old wounds of my errors. During all that time, I distanced you from me, without listening or really talking to you. I was even close to losing your mother's love. But when I saw you in the hermitage yesterday, I finally understood everything. I feel that I've changed. And now, I can make up for all the bad I've caused, being with you and helping Elida, Walter stopped and, for the first time since he began speaking, he looked Ulrich in the eyes. Ulrich tried to smile back. What do you say? Are you willing to give me another chance? The young man approached him, holding out his hand. We have a lot to work on and it will be very dangerous. We're really going to need you to make it out of all this. Father and son exchanged a strong handshake. Do you have a moment? Jeremy asked. Elida was in Professor Hertz's office. She had retrieved the dossier of codes that they hadn't yet managed to make sense of and, perched on a tower of magazines, was contemplating the sheaf of papers in her hands without blinking. She didn't even raise her head to greet Jeremy when he sat beside her. He happily explained to her that Hertz telephoned everyone's parents. Given that Jeremy's lived in a city far away, the meeting would take place the following day. When they arrive, the professor will bring back their memories and put them to work together on the scanner. At first, the principal had some objections, especially about the idea of giving the children two days of holiday, but in the end Hertz managed to win him over. Yumi and Odd were still prisoners in the virtual world and they had a lot of work ahead of them. We've almost done it, Jeremy concluded, giving his friend a warm smile. Soon, you'll also be able to enter the mirror. Elida seemed pensive, completely absorbed in the papers. Hey, are you listening? I still can't understand it, the girl murmured. This program. It's incomplete, that's why Hertz never used it until now. It's missing some chunks. Jeremy leaned in to look at the pages. Indeed, Elida could have been right. But, to be sure, they had to thoroughly study these pages and do some simulations on the computer. Well, he said, it seems obvious that it's missing some parts. We also have to take Richard's palm computer into account, and there's also the mirror as well. And the first city. It's likely that your father dispersed several fragments of the program throughout the various virtual worlds. Elida shook her head. She picked up another sheaf of papers from the floor. Here. Richard printed me the codes that appeared on his palm computer. If you look at them carefully, you can see that they have nothing to do with the code down. It's like a completely different program. Hmm, the girl smiled. There was something more. 
In my memories, I had a sort of flashback, a fragment in which I seemed to be in the hermitage with my father, and he asked me to help him do something important. But I can't remember what it was. Well, Jeremy consoled her, I wouldn't worry about that if I were you. Since you lost your memory during the Christmas holidays, your memories have been a confused mess. But you reclaim more each day that passes. This is different, Elida retorted, shaking her head. Even if I can't remember why. Thank you for that live show. Looks like things are getting set to get the group back together. And it looks like something with Ilea in the past will happen soon. I have another episode recorded, so I'll slap some music on that and I'll get that going so everybody can have a second episode when Halloween comes by. I will not spoil what happens in that episode, but I assure you, it will be a doozy. So I hope you tune in next time for the next episode, and I hope I can get it done as fast and best I can. Until then, subscribe and give it a like, and I'll talk to you all later. Mm.